Can you tell us about Inside Voice? I'm enjoying it tremendously. So Inside Voice, it's been a lifelong passion for me. It's an audio book. The great news is, is that you don't actually have to read this book. I'm going to read it to you, and it is an auditory experience. So it's sort of like fun with sociology. It's like pop sociology where we get to dissect and kind of investigate a tool that we often just don't take notice of, which is our voice, of course, our speaking voice, not our you know, singing a voice and all that jazz, but actually the one that relates to all the people around you, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your children, your parents within your work. It's the communication tool that we take advantage of and take for granted every day. And, you know, I think initially I kind of became enamored of the vocal tool as something of interest mainly because I enjoy playing with voices and I like accents and dialects and I feel like they're the portal into a wealth of story and narrative. But then as an extension, I feel like Inside Voice is kind of like the post-grad college level course that I always wanted, you know. Right. You don't realize how sort of invested in the subject you are until someone says, hey, do you like the sound of your voice? You know, if I play back a voicemail, do you mind listening to it and relishing in it? And they'll go, oh, God, please don't, you know, or whatever. Oh, I hate my voice. I have a hard time listening to this podcast. And same thing with like watching a movie that I've been in or a project or whatever. You can't do the mirror face all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like a more honest reflection of kind of who we are. That's so great. So the mirror face, because of course, what you're talking about is the idea that, you know, for a photograph or the mirror, you're making this very beautiful kind of postured depiction of yourself within a split second. But then, of course, in motion picture, you're moving around. It's jarring because it feels like the Band-Aid's been pulled off, you know, like exposing Mm -hmm. of oneself in an honest kind of way. I had done a lot of voice work in Seattle growing up, but it was, you know, industrial or like a regional commercial. But my first animated movie was Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And I could not believe how difficult it was. (laughs) The shaping of a character and in solitude. I mean, it was awesome. I learned a lot. But, you know, you take those jobs and me being kind of naive, it's like, Well, I'm just in and out. I'm in my pajamas. But truly, like the shaping of an animated character, would you say like you kind of have to infuse it with more roundness in your sentence structure? Am I onto something here? You're onto something for sure, because you're being thoughtful about how your voice became all of a sudden under a microscope. But let's talk about, you know, obviously it's the vocal tool, not the sentence structure, right? Like you're given words and then you have to create this sort of robust, full character with just the sound that you're emanating. And so, yes, I find that really vulnerable. A lot of voice work is super vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're playing into is like, all of a sudden you're naked because the only thing that you can utilize to create the life and breath of a character, you cannot default to what you're putting out there in the visuals. You can only do it with your sound. And so your breath and how you, you know, take in the space, what you do and don't, the negative and the positive of the sounds that you're creating is what's kind of building the architecture of that character. But even more so, I think what you said, which is really interesting, is there is this sense of play when we think about voice. Yeah. Especially performers. We're thinking, oh, wow, this is such a fun tool to wield and to ping pong and to make silly, you know, sounds, but then also to create characters. And I would just argue, I don't even think you have to be a performer to find that fun. I mean, my dad, my mom, my brother, we're all guilty. I see everyone in my family guilty of that kind of vocal play around the people they're with, you know, where they style shift. And I just want to ask you, where are you from originally? What sounds did you grow up with? I love this question. I grew up north of Seattle and I was a really short kid. And I say this because it defined me in my quietness. Like I wanted to just fly under the radar at school, but I also really wanted to be heard. You know, like I had a little bit of a Napoleon complex. I was searching for power. And when I was doing theater, you know, we did a lot of like diaphragm exercises. I was always proud that people in the back row could hear me, like my grandparents. 
Yeah. But what it was also really interesting about Inside Voice, as I was thinking about it, is how we shape our voices. Yeah. If I just listen, I've been like closing my eyes and listening to your voice in a more sort of curious and investigative way. And I feel like our voices without too much sort of psychoanalysis here because I'm not a licensed professional, but I do feel like our voices are imbued with our traumas, our histories, our physical experiences, as well as the color of all the people that have influenced us and our exposures in that way. And for you, it's interesting. Your vocal quality, it's not super deep, but you do have a croak in there, which is beautiful and kind of like a, it's in there and it's It's all the healthy living. Well, it will speak (laughs) to, right? Like, did you ever smoke? Yeah. So did I, you know, and I have a bit of a croak as well. But we also have had children. And so your voice hormonally changes after children. And then additionally, like traumas, happinesses, heartbreaks, all kinds of things. Pride, like I wanted to be taken seriously. Yeah. Your S's are almost sibilant. They've got some very sexy S's that you've got going on. And then you've got your croak. Those are the two kind of fun, quirky elements in your voice that I'm interested in. And I was curious if you were aware of them. No, and I thank you. And what is it? Authentic marzipan? Authoritative marzipan. Authoritative. (laughs) Authoritative. Go for it. Authoritative marzipan. Now say it without thinking about it too much. Authoritative marzipan. (laughs) Ooh, very good. It was like I was directing you and you uh, took out the direction very well. Oh, please (laughs) do. I loved In a World. Thank you. And... I have seen BlackRock four times. Really? Oh, that's hardcore. That's like girl power, big time. Yeah. I loved that movie. Katie Aslington kicking ass as a director on that and an actress. You are brilliant. Thank you. And it made me feel envious and inspired, you know? You want to go camping with us? (laughs) Yes, I do. That movie touched something like deep in my childhood. Yeah, because I feel like last time we were on the show, we talked about that. Oh, did we? Oh, God. No, you did because you really connect with that movie. I really did. Now, your voice is really unique. And actually, speaking of House Bunny, did you kind of utilize a different vocal tone and texture and affectation for that? Because didn't you kind of pitch up a little bit? Well, the thing with Shelly, you know, yeah, it's just hope. It's hope. And she just sees the good in everybody. Okay. So that's beautiful. So you did pitch up. Yeah, I guess I did. (laughs) Exactly. Because Shelly has a little bit of little girl in her, right? The hope and optimism of humanity, even though she lived in the Playboy Mansion. Well, exactly. But then when you speak on your podcast, your voice is more grounded and a little more, I've had a life experience. And what you're showing me with that life experience is a little deeper resonant sound. Thank you. I think. I mean, I don't know if it was a compliment. It was an analyzation, but I appreciate that. Yeah, it's an observation versus a compliment. Not to say, I mean, I love you, but I'm just saying that you're right to say that because I have been in my own process about voice I'm not saying it's better or worse to be higher pitched or lower pitched, but I'm saying I'm observing in you, even if you play back the tape, when you're doing Shelly versus you saying, I don't know if that was a compliment or not, you know, you can hear the difference in pitch. Yeah. I want to talk to you about your personal stuff, but I'm too curious also to ask your thoughts on the place of the female voice and what female voices succeed in terms of Let's put this specifically to like news. Sure. So in the book, I get into this pretty expansively because I am curious. Well, I'm also just like excited and interested around the subject of the female voice, all voices, but the female one being really kind of fraught because we have collectively as a society such an opinion about what female voices should and shouldn't sound like in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So for instance... And I talk about this in the book and it's really fun. You know, I play some games about politicians, like what is a female politician, a person in power, a person of great authority? What should they sound like, you know, versus someone who's selling you a palm olive dish soap? You know, if you're hearing that voiceover, is that going to be the voiceover of someone really practical and kind of like a house mom, not sexualized at all? Now, the politician, just to roll back the tape a little bit. So the politician thing, you have some politicians in history. I talk about Margaret Thatcher, 
versus Hillary Clinton versus Sarah Palin and then AOC. All very different vocalizations of a female political sound. That said, some work, some don't. And, you know, you could say, well, the Margaret Thatcher thing is totally crazy. I mean, it's bananas, right? You know, she lowered her voice about two octaves from her natural sound to sound more masculine, I guess. Just like Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, to say, hey, take me seriously. I sound more like a man, which is like, yeah, totally gendered and really, you know, ripe for discussion. Guilty. (laughs) (laughs) And guilty. (laughs) But people elected Margaret Thatcher twice, you know, so it seemed to work and everyone believed Elizabeth Holmes, you know, for a long time. People gave her millions and millions of dollars. So it is that thing of, wow, let's go ahead and dial back and really just unpack it and be like little scientists, sociologists. And yeah, it's really an investigation of those things. But I personally think, yeah, of course, I want women to sound however the fuck they want to sound. But at the same token, I mean, of course, I have my own opinions. I love a lot of reality television. Yes. But the Kardashians are tough for me. Okay. All right. All right, let's talk about it. I don't know if it's a lack of facial expression (laughs) or vocal fry or whatever, which is a term that has it been overused and underexamined, maybe? Have you gotten into the chapter on sexy baby yet in my book? Uh Uh-uh. Oh, you're going to have so much fun. Oh, good, good, good. Will you tell us about sexy baby? It's pitch up and it's vocal fry. Yeah. And it's up top. That's an interesting trend, though, because traditionally up talk has been the generations before her. Right. It would be like, I went into the store and I bought some grapes. And that's not a question, you know? Right. It's like, did you buy grapes or not? Right. (laughs) And so we're hearing a lot of it. And it's not negating like intellect or socioeconomics, but it is like grown women who are choosing to speak that way. I have a little bit of a problem with it, but I also want to embrace it. Well, it's just like, what is like... Take out like and do it without like. Okay. Because what you're using is like to get into it. But right. And just speak like you, like speak with your own brains and then use it. Let's play with that. I wonder what the goal is. That was really good. So I feel like this is a trend. It's a vocal trend. And it's okay. Okay. Look, Malcolm Gladwell in the book really interrogates me on this, so it's really fun. And I get him to do the vocal fry, which is fun. Oh, I can't wait. So, Lake, here's what I want to ask you. Okay. I like to talk about, like, a heartbreak in your life or your favorite place on Earth. Well, you know, something I woke up thinking about was just, and also it kind of plays into, you know, you're married now and you, as a woman in your 40s, you know, what's so interesting about being in relationships later in life in your 40s is that you have two fully baked adults. Yes. That are meeting like, hey, I'm an adult over here and here's my whole community and children and family and interests. And that's the same on the other side in theory, right? You want two equal footed people who are baked. The idea of two fully baked adults coming together is like two full communities, like two countries communing. And when you're in your 20s, even your early 30s, you're dating in a way that's like, oh, I don't know. It's all fluid. Like we're all still finding who's going to be our forever people, our forever community, our forever friends. We're checking things off the list and we have to be ambitious, like super ambitious during those times. Yeah. So it's really interesting, I feel you know, when you're in your 40s, you're not like, I need to be with someone ASAP. It's not like that, at least for me, it's not. It's more like, I am curious about people and I'm excited to be curious about people. You know, it's like when you commune with someone or you start dating someone or you're interested in someone, it is just interesting to be like, oh, you've already got all your adult friendships up and running and me too. And I have not only adult friendships, I have a family and you have a family. You know, it's like a very interesting. Yeah. So we don't go out. Yeah. What was it like to blend fam? I mean, what are your hot topics there? Well, I would kind of like shake at night. I remember. I mean, this was early on, you know, but I love that I have a very mature partner, Mm -hmm. an unbelievably mature partner. I felt childish for a minute. I felt crazy. I felt like 
these new kids in my life were like all play partners. Right. Like I was going to be so fun and play the music really loud and like take them cool places and buy them expensive shit or whatever. Like I I felt kind of spinny with it, you know? Mm. I'm the youngest child. My relationship with babies has always been like a little, huh. <laughs> <laughs> huh. But you like kids. I really like kids. So it's been fucking awesome. It's been wonderful. Can you tell us your least favorite work experience? I would say this. My least favorite part of our industry, (laughs) you know, now that I am making movies, putting together movies and writing and directing and all that jazz and producing, I find the function and the kind of mechanics of putting together an independent feature to be rewarding, but then also I have had moments where I feel downtrodden. Like I'm a very optimistic person. I operate with great belief in my team and myself. Which is how you should. You have to, but I am disappointed in parts of the process, which really I have in the past, like I'd say four years, I've undergone some real disappointments where I go, wow, the fundraising mechanism that I tried to build and that a lot of people told me, yeah, 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 yes, 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 and green light, green light. And then it was like real carpet pulling from under your footing. I had that a couple of times with both financing and casting. And if you're just asking from a work standpoint, for me, that stuff is really disenchanted. You know, it gives me a little sprinkle of cynicism, but I shake it off. But The truth is, it's the greatest job. I feel so grateful that I get to do what I do. And because I have had really scary things with my children and their health, I always keep it in context. And it really allows for me to not really let my knickers get in a twist about it. It's just that when you ask, I mean, I've had financiers, male financiers on the phone going, yeah, I understand you want to cast her, but, you know, I wouldn't fuck her. Like, I've had that. I've heard that. Uh And that makes Uh me want to die. You know, I've heard those things and gone, wow, so you disrespect me that you're so unaware that you're talking to a female writer, director, producer, and actor. First of all, this is what you're really thinking. And also read the goddamn room, you know, like I'm going to give you any kind of camaraderie. And by the way, as a sidebar, my unprofessional self is like, of course, that woman wouldn't fuck you because you're a fucking troll. You know, yeah. But having to compose myself and sort of say, hey, that's really inappropriate. I don't know if that's conducive or productive in this meeting right now. Let's move forward. You know, like, but those kind of things bum me out that they still exist. And it's always like not a shock, but shocking, you know, can't cast things because, you know, you're like, oh, this person, this woman is perfect for this role. And they're like, she doesn't move the needle enough, which is just fancy talk for she can't get us enough money. And it's just kind of like a boner killer, you know, when you're in the creative space. Hi, Sally. Hi, Sally. Hello. I'm here with Lake Bell, and she is just lovely. Sally, will you tell us what's going on? Well, this is a story about me and my brother. I'm going to go ahead and call him Joe for the time being. Me and Joe are approximately four years apart, and we have had a very toxic relationship for about as long as I can remember. And I probably am not alone in this universe when I say that he has to be the most toxic family member that I think I have ever dealt with in my life. And I wanted to discuss this, and hopefully someone else out there is listening to this and can also relate it. Can you define, because obviously toxicity comes in many different forms, and I really do relate to what you're saying, just being that there is this person in your family that is that way. But could you help distinguish and maybe clarify what that means to you? Okay. After my parents passed away, I started going to therapy, which has been a tremendous change in my life. So many positive things have changed from that. And the course of dealing with the grief of losing my mom to cancer and losing my dad about a year later to a heart attack in the process of dealing with all of that, it came to fruition that I had actually been sexually assaulted by my brother. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. My therapist actually called it disassociation and uh, displacement. 
essentially I buried it so deep in that file that do not disturb until you're much stronger. Mm-hmm. Well, it came out to lot. Just a lot of things came back. Not only was I actually assaulted, but my brother held my face over an open flame and burnt my face and hair. Oh, my God. And he's four years older than you. Yes. And when did your parents pass or what year did your mom pass? My mom passed in July of 2015 and my dad in December of 2017. Oh, babe. You have fucking gone through it. My God. You're being very vulnerable and generous with your sharing today, and it's very hard. And I just want to give you a lot of acknowledgement and credit in that. I appreciate that. I wish that was just kind of like the tip of the iceberg, but it's really not. My brother was very physically abusive towards me, not only burning my face, but he broke my nose when I was little. He was so angry. Yes, Can I ask how old you are, just to understand contextually where you are in your life? I'm 35. Okay. Does he live in the same town as you? Where is he in proximity to you? He is the next county over. We live in different cities. But I have not talked to him since my dad passed. Right around that time, let's say between like 2014 and 2016, 17, when you guys were talking, what was that kind of communication like then as you guys became adults? It got better for a very brief period of time, particularly when my mom was battling cancer. But it didn't really last a long time. Like I said, it was a very short period of time. And it was kind of like just friendlier texts or friendlier encounters, not like a true, well, God, how do you reconcile with this? It's kind of, we chose to communicate and put our differences aside just essentially for the sake of our parents. We tried not to interact with each other, but if we were, we were very cordial, if that makes sense. Sorry, just for context, did you grow up in a household where any adults showed him this type of behavior? Absolutely not. Not with my mom and not with my father. But my mom was raised by an alcoholic and she left home when she was 15 years old and she had my brother when she was 19. Oh. Like I said, she suffered a lot and for her to come on the other side of just a traumatic upbringing and not allow it to come be a part of our household is just absolutely amazing. She was an angel. This is a character strength on your end. You're very generous. I have an older brother and he's tall and big. We love each other now, but man, I hated him for years. He was really physical with me too. He was just big and strong and I was just something he would just flick away. But, you know, I was always getting, like, my head shoved into the snow. Nothing comparative, Sally, but I was always mad at my mom because I would say, you know, Mom, there's such a deep injustice. I didn't say injustice, but I would say, like, Mom, protect me. Yeah, and she never really heard me very well. It just felt like she was really protective of him. I guess what I'm saying is, your memory of your mom and your generosity towards her experience, which was, you know, very much earned your love and loyalty for her. But I wonder, did she kind of have that same thing that my mom did, where she was a little more disbelieving or a little bit more like, oh, you guys will be best friends one day, that kind of a thing? Yes, exactly what you've said. I had that relationship with my big brother where so much bigger than me. And he would overpower me to put my five in display here. Growing up, I was extremely little. I was actually a premature baby. When I started kindergarten, I was actually 22 pounds and like 21 inches tall and wore 18 month clothes. Like I was extremely little. Did everybody pick you up all the time? I hated being picked up. Yes, I was actually a flyer and cheerleading for that reason as well. And my brother was the total opposite. My brother is six foot four, over 250 pounds, built like a defensive linebacker. He's always been huge. And my mom was very much the same way about Joe that your mom was with your brother. And yeah. You're probably just overreacting or it's not that bad. You'll be best friends one day. It's not as bad as you make it seem. Right. My dad was the opposite though. My dad pretty much always was like my line and my defender. Oh, 
Like he always wanted the very best for me, always believed me, was always in my corner. And if I told him anything, he always took it to heart. And he always tried his best to solve the problem as best as he could. And a lot of my moms was, it's not that bad. It'll be better tomorrow. I won't deal with this. Sally, your brother is unwell. Yeah. You lived with someone who is unwell. And I mean, I know you know that. Yes. My heart hurts for you. And your parents did the best that they could based off of what they had in their toolbox emotionally. Uh And your mother probably endured an abusive household herself. So her denial of, hey, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, is echoing from a place of her own little girl self. Yes. And your father, I mean, he did the best he fucking could. Uh But you have endured such pain. And personally, I'm like, the further you can be away from this person, I say you don't have to ever talk to this person for the rest of your life, in my opinion. A lot of my family members, particularly my dad's side of the family, like his brothers and sisters and their siblings, their brothers, cousins, um, told me that my brother has recently had a heart attack and a stroke, and he is now in a nursing home facility. Okay. And that I need to make amends with my brother and that I need to be the one to reach out and resolve our issues. Why? Why? Who says that? In case it passes away and that I would have it on my phone. Sally, no. No. What is that? Are we in like turn of the century Russia? No, that's not real. What's real is you paid your dues. I mean, look, we're not professionals, but the point is what feels right in your heart? I mean, do you want to go and make, what do you have to say sorry for? You don't have nothing to say sorry for. That's exactly what I think too. How much do they know, first of all? I mean, listen, I think you should view your relationship with your brother as sadly another death. I feel strongly about this because, Sally, the only responsibility you have is you. That's your charge, your side of the street. You care for you. You've been through fucking hell and back, okay? You don't need to owe him anything. So, Lake, give us some ideas of if this comes up with a cousin, which I think the inclination is weird. I mean, I'm assuming, Sally, that your cousins don't know. Yeah, about the sexual assault. Right. I mean, they clearly think that you should go make amends with him. So what do they know of your relationship? And I'm not suggesting that you tell them anything. They don't know everything, but I have disclosed within the last probably two weeks or so that I was sexually assaulted by my brother on numerous occasions and numerous locations. When I say that, I mean at different people's houses, like at family friends' houses, at my own house. So they do know that. Okay, Sally, family members who are saying you should make amends, they're looking for ways for them to feel more comfortable because it's very difficult when a family has a rift. And so they would like it for you to make amends with him so they feel better. But things are uncomfortable sometimes. And when someone has abused you, you owe them nothing. You owe you to take care of you and do the things you need. You have to be gracious to yourself. You've been through pain. You've lost your parents. This is the beginning of the rest of your life. You know, you have great promise as long as you take care of you. Uh That's my personal opinion as just a big sister and a mom. I have a couple of relatives that I have chosen to totally cut off without drama. You know, my parents were kind of worried about what it meant when I said, I want to do this without drama, but I'm never talking to him again. All right. And I said, this is going to be easy. I'm not asking you at all to not have a relationship with him. I do think that it's easier for me because I live in California. I live far away. I've been gone for a long time. So it's easy for me. And I don't know what that's like for you with your family. Like, there is still a nagging thing because I did grow up in a household where we always got together with our aunts and uncles and cousins, always. Now that your parents are gone, are you close with your aunts and uncles? I am very, very close. With my dad's side of the family, I have pretty much no relationship with my mom, brothers and sisters. Well, I'm glad that you're really close. But was the cousin that told you that you should go make amends by going to visit him in the nursing home, was that a female cousin or a male cousin? A female cousin. Okay. How close are you with her? Very close. 
We're always at each other's houses for big events. Our kids exchange presents. Her youngest son is about five months older than my youngest son. She's not going to disown you if you don't, right? Like you guys are family. Yeah. I would call her and tell her, when you told me that I should go make amends, it really kind of twisted me. I love you so much and I need you. But I got to tell you, suggesting that it's been like the hamster wheel at nighttime and I can't shake it. And I just want you to know that I don't think I can see him. I don't want to see him. And I, of course, have complicated feelings about it. However you want to phrase this, Sally, but does that sound all right? That does sound all right. I feel like he's occupying so much space in you. I know. I want him out too. You do your therapy. Yeah. Continue with that. I love that you're doing that and you're giving that to you, Sally. Like you're taking care of you. And Sally, this will always be a deep scar in you. They'll fade slowly. EMDR. Just say this to your therapist. Say, would you ever do EMDR with me? I have done that technique. Okay, good. I think you might need to continue to do that because I can tell when you're speaking of him, it's still in the voice. You can hear that it's still haunting you a bit. And so stay with that practice because, boy... I admit to, and I've spoken about this not a lot, but I am a victim of sexual assault and rape as well. And I can tell you the only thing that allows for me to talk about it without the quiver and the pain, because it's not infecting the me that sits here now, is EMDR. For me, it's for different people, but it's important to maintain, to continue that love and care to yourself. Thank you. I'm glad you said that because everything of what you just said is so accurate. Oh my God, Sally. I'm so glad that we got to talk to you. Yeah. And Lake, I'm so glad you were here. I think like the loving honesty with your cousin will bring you guys closer, hopefully. If she pushes back, that's kind of a warning sign a little bit, but I don't think she will. Gosh, even if she does push back, let's just play that out really quick before we let you go. But if she does push back, I would almost argue that might be a knee-jerk response. Let her get it out. Say, look, I'm not asking you to respond to this right away. I'm taking that off the plate. I'm just telling you where I'm coming from. I would love your support. And this is kind of my boundary for me. I'm not going to be seeing him. I'm not going to make amends with him. I appreciate you bringing all those things to me because you were thinking, oh, I want them to make amends. But on my side of the street, it doesn't work for me because it's a painful thing that I'm still working on in my own therapy. But I don't feel I owe him that, you know, because I would love to hear him come to me, but that's not possible given his physicality. So the point is, I'm going to do my work on it. I love you so much. You're so important to me. You're like a sister. I want to build our relationship away from that issue. Yeah, I feel for you, Sally. I have a few wonderful, sweet, awesome little baby boys. Oh, one is seven, one will be three. And neither one of my boys have met Joe. And I'm just going to keep it that way. Yeah, girl. Totally great. You are supported. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And you're going to advocate. You have the chance to, you know, if your kids say, hey, you know, something's up. This person said this to me or this happened. You are going to advocate for them and you're going to advocate for yourself. You will not let that happen again to you because you're a mom now and it's your responsibility to take care of yourself and your children. And you'll be that strong mama for them. Yes. I'm glad that you mentioned the word advocate because I actually am a lawyer. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And my therapist is basically under the impression that I got into the career that I got in because of all of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I became an actor because of my older brother. You know, I needed to be heard somehow or whatever. But Sally, you know, we do spend so much time in the past and we're so comparative. Like my brother was this and I was this, the juxtaposition of our positions. And we do it all the time. Like I grew up here, I was this person. But I think viewing yourself as an only child and attempting to kind of shed the comparison identity that you labeled yourself. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yes, it does. Sally, I can't thank you enough. This has been really meaningful, and I so appreciate you, and I love you, and I have your back. Thank you, God, for having me on. You kind of just clarified everything that I was thinking initially anyway, 
and you just helped me find the closure. Good. Thank God. You're amazing. You're really, really strong. Look what you've done. Yeah. Thank you. I've been extremely impressed with your work, too. One of my favorite movies is The House Bunny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sally. I have a wonderful day. Lake, you were amazing. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much for like sharing. And like I was saying, though, I am very, very grateful you were here for this caller. I was like, no. Yeah. I just, oh God, I'm such like an empath where I'm immediately like, what can we do? I'm putting energy out into the universe for this woman. Yes. Yeah. Like, I'm really happy that I'm alive in a time when you're alive. Oh. I like you for that. That's a very nice compliment. Thank you. I really am. I'm very appreciative of you and your work. I think you're brilliant. Thank you. I am legit blushing. I so appreciate you. I love you. Sending love. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Great week. 